Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. So listen now to the reading of God's word. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes. And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and they returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what they had uh, what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Pray again with me. Father in heaven, we pray that you will break the bread of your word and feed it to us and make our hearts burn Jesus as you open up the scriptures and show us what they mean. Bring us to life. Open our eyes. Make our hearts burn, Jesus. Give us an encounter with you. We pray in your name. Amen. So I want to talk today about the importance of having an encounter with Jesus. So have you had an encounter with Jesus? Maybe you're someone who says, yeah, I have. I encountered Jesus a long time ago. And it's been a great life since then. And so hopefully if that's you, then this message will just encourage you about how important it is to keep having this encounter with Jesus. Or if you're someone else who, being honest, you, you might have to say, you know, I'm just not sure. 
I'm not sure if I've had an encounter with Jesus. I'm not sure if I'm born again. I, I don't know if I've really experienced his presence or not. And so I want to talk today about the importance of having an encounter with Jesus. And so we're looking at this third gospel. It's from Luke. And Dr. Luke, Luke was a very, the author was a very intelligent man. He was a physician, but he was also a historian. And so he went around, he was actually a companion of the Apostle Paul's, and he went around and got um, eyewitness interviews with everyone there to make this gospel, the third gospel of Luke. And so we're looking at what Luke recorded. And this is the day of Easter, but it's not in the morning, it's later in the afternoon. And so you've got this, these two people. You've got Cleopas is one, and we don't know who the other was. Is it, was it a woman? Was it a man? We just don't know. And so they're walking, and they're walking away from Jerusalem. And it says Emmaus was a little town seven miles away from there. So here they are, and they're walking away from Emmaus. Now, these two are totally depressed. They're so sad, and they're just confused as they walk away. And they're talking about everything that had just happened in the Passion Week of Jesus. And so they're talking all about that. And then as they're walking and as they're talking, some stranger just comes up. They don't know, they didn't see him come up, but he's walking with them and he's listening to them as they talk about the things. And so then he, he asks the question to them. In a sense, what he asks is, what in the world are you guys talking about? And then they, it makes them stop and ask him the question, are you the only one in this whole country, essentially, that hasn't heard, you know, it, it would, you know what it'd be like today? It'd be like if you were talking, you were out somewhere and you were talking about the coronavirus and you're with someone and they said, what's the coronavirus? We'd, we'd, <laughs> we'd be shocked and say, are you the only one who doesn't know about the coronavirus? And so that's what they say to Jesus. Are you the only one who doesn't know about this past week, the, the week of your of not your, they didn't know, the week of Jesus' passion and all the things, it was, it was an event. It was like a national event. Now, they're walking along and they're talking about that and really they have no hope. They said, we had hope. And that's past tense. And so they've got no hope uh, as they keep going. And so they, they said, are you the only one who doesn't know about these things? And it's so funny, it's really the height of irony when Jesus says, you know, Jesus is like the center point of all of it. It was him himself that was all happening to him. And he says, what things? Now, why did he ask that? And, and, and but let's also ask, why is it that they don't recognize him? I mean, they had sit and listened to him so many times. They had looked at him so many times. Why is it that they don't recognize him? Well, we don't really know why they didn't recognize him. Was it that our resurrected bodies are different enough? Will our resurrected bodies, when we're on the new earth and we've got these new glorified, resurrected, physical, but very different bodies on the new earth, uh, of course, they'll have continuity between this body and that body, this old dying body and that new glorified perfect body. There's continuity, but, but of course there's difference. Jesus, he's, he's walking in and out of walls. He's vanishing. He's, he's, he shows him his scars. He eats fish. And so is it that his body's different enough that they didn't recognize him? Don't know. Is it that they had divine, you know, um, prevention, restraining. It was divine restraining them to see that it really was him. We really just don't know. But they didn't recognize him. And so they, they he says, what things? And one thing that that did is it really allowed them to be able to be honest, to be able to give their own perspective. You know, if he'd have said, I'm Jesus, of course, you know, that would have dominated the whole conversation from there on. But thinking that this guy doesn't know anything 
and he just gives them the opportunity to really give their own real deepest heart about it, to give their own perspective. And so they were really, free. he left them really free to be able to say exactly how they felt about it and what their perspective really was about it. And their perspective, as we see, is that they have lost all hope. In fact, I want to consider, it's amazing that no one understood this. None of the disciples, no one, Peter and John and the 11, they didn't understand it. And it's amazing because Jesus had told them so many times he was going to rise. Um, and so Peter and John and the 11, they didn't understand how death was somehow supposed to be so central to it all. They just didn't understand. Remember, they said when, when, the angel, when the women came back and said, oh, yeah, we've seen angels that said he's risen. The wording in the passage, it says that it made no sense. It seemed like nonsense to them. This just didn't make sense to them. They had no hope. Mother Mary had no hope. The women going to the tomb early Sunday morning, they were not going there to welcome some wonderful risen Christ. They were bringing spices with them. In a sense, they were going there to make the final, you know, specifics on his casket, in a sense. They were going there to make the final deadness a final. That's why they were going. They had no hope either. And these two walking on the road said, we had hoped. That's past tense. All hope is gone. It's so amazing. No one understood. No one connected the dots of how central death had to be to it. You know, and even though their whole culture was centered around death because their whole culture was centered Israel around the temple. And the center of the temple, of course, was the lamb sacrifices. And yet somehow they didn't connect any of that. You got the whole Old Testament. That's all about the necessity of death, of a substitutionary death. And, and so you've got Jesus here amazed that they, no one, not a one of them, connected the dots. No one understood. And I think that's why Jesus is so passionate. That's why he gets so emotional. He says, oh, foolish ones. It's because that's how down they were. Jesus' emotion is reacting and responding to their emotional depression of how sad and how void of hope they were because they didn't realize how central death should have been obvious to them. And it, their need for a death should have been obvious, and yet they are hopeless. And so, you know, one thing that this makes you think of is the bookends of Luke's artistry here in writing this gospel. Think about the bookends that he uses of the two very similar episodes in chapter 2 and verse 41. These two episodes of couples, two, that um, were going away from Jerusalem. They were, each of them were taking a day's trip away from Jerusalem. You've got in 241, you've got Mary and Joseph there, and Jesus is 12 years old. This is at the beginning. And you've got similarly a day's journey away from Jerusalem. And then they lose Jesus for three days. After which, of course, they find him in both, both events, both episodes. And Jesus in both places has to say, has to explain, didn't you understand that I would be in my father's house doing my father's work? Do you see those two bookends of Jesus getting lost for three days and having to explain what was going on. And so then they eventually get there. So these two, they, they, Jesus, he explains the Old Testament to them. He says, and, and it says their hearts burned as Jesus was explaining the scriptures. And of course, the scriptures there would have been only the Old Testament. And Jesus, he explains how the whole thing was pointing to him. And so as they go on, he acts as though he's going to keep going. And so, and so their hearts warmed to this guy. That, and of course, you know, it's nighttime. 
Who knows what dangers might have been on the road if he kept going at night. So they call him, they invite him to stay and stay with them. And so he does. And then he goes in and he, uh, they have a meal. He takes the bread and he breaks it. And here's one thing I want you to notice as well. Let's appreciate the parallel stories between this meal where Jesus breaks the bread and gives it to them and their eyes are open. The parallel between this and Genesis chapter three, verse six, where we are reminded of the very first meal, the meal of the fruit, where Eve takes the fruit and it says she took it, she gave it, and then they ate and it says their eyes were opened. And of course, what they were opened to was to sin and death. And the truth is really, all death can be traced back to this moment when their eyes were opened. And here is Jesus in kind of a parallel episode where he too, he takes it, he gives it, they eat, and then their eyes are opened not to death, but to the glorious truth of new life, that he is risen and that they too will one day be risen. Their eyes are opened to Jesus and to new life. You know, Jesus, he proved himself that he was resurrected. It is a, it is a, a fact, it's a historic fact as we've said before, the Bible is historic documentation for us. And so we've got here are eyewitness accounts that Jesus really was alive. And here's one thing to point out, to remember again, that Jesus did not come back to life in his old dying body. Jesus didn't come back to life like Jairus' daughter was brought back to life. Jesus didn't come back to life like Lazarus as he had brought Mary and Martha's brother back to life. Or you can think of others that Jesus brought to life, like the widow of Nain, whose son had died, and he brings him back together. Jesus didn't come back to life like they came back to life because they, of course, sadly, they sadly one day would have to die again. They came back through death's door, through death's front door, they came back through death's door, but of course, back to an old dying body and would have to go back through, again, death's door. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus went through death out to the other side of death. Jesus went into, in a sense, the new world that is coming for all of us. It is not here yet. But Jesus' body is a part of, of the new earth. It's a part of the new world. It's a part of new creation that is going to happen. In Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus described and pointed out that there will be a new earth. He said, in the new world, and that's the same wording as reborn. And so this world is going to be reborn. It's not going to be an other earth. It's going to be a new earth that's been regenerated and made new. And so that new world that's coming, the future has burst into the present with Jesus's body. Jesus's body is both a part of the new world to come and it's a sign of the new world that is coming. And so Jesus here, he came back to life, not back through death's door, but he went through death to the other side of death, to new life. And, he's, and, and, he, and his body, his new life, his new body burst onto the scene of our old world and showed us what is coming. Now let's look um, lastly at how these, these two disciples, Cleopas and his friend, whoever it was, these two were changed. And by the way, two is significant. In the Bible, different numbers have meaning. And two, of course, is the number of what would be considered a true witness. In other words, in a court of law, if just one person was a witness, that wouldn't be sufficient to 
to have a big sentence of something. But if you had two witnesses, that would establish a, a, a truth. That would establish a witness, two would. And of course you have two here. And now it says when Jesus, they went into their home, they finally got, we presume that's their home was where they were going. And so they went in, they were staying and it was at night and they were having their meal. And as Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it and then he gave it to them and he blessed it. And then when they ate it, it said their eyes were open. Now, exactly why? Why and how were their eyes open? Was it because maybe they saw the nail prints in his hands when he blessed it, maybe? Is that how they recognized him? Was it maybe because the way he talked to his father made it clear who he really was. Maybe is, uh, you know, they, had, they hadn't been in the upper room for the Last Supper, but they had seen him break bread like that many times. Was it in the way that he did that? Was it because God made him born again at that moment? And, and they were spiritually enabled to see and put it all together and experience that this really is, that they had eyes to see, that this really is the risen Jesus we don't know. All it says is that their eyes were open and they did recognize him. Now, here's one thing. It says, didn't they said when they recognized him, they said, didn't our hearts burn? See, they were so changed. Their eyes are open. Their hearts are caught on fire. And they said, didn't our hearts burn when he opened up the scriptures to us? I want to pause just there for a second and realize you know, part of realizing Jesus is being able to see in the Old Testament how really the whole Old Testament is all about him. And when we start to really see that and understand it, it just makes our hearts burn. It, we see that it really is not just some preacher's idea or whatever. We start to see it really is God's total intention was to show us Jesus in the Old Testament. And not just a few texts, not just a few verses that are proof text about Jesus. It's when you see the whole flow of creation, fall, redemption, and a coming consummation. When you see the story, it's really one story about Jesus, about the second Adam, the second representative of mankind. And when we really start to put that together and we see it in the Old Testament, it makes our hearts burn. It changes us. And it brings not just our head to be entertained by facts. We come and we hear some sermon and we're, we're amused by the details of the story and we're, we're changed mentally. But when we encounter Jesus, we also have an emotional and heart. It's not just our head, but it's our heart as well burns and we see it and we get excited about the fact that it's true. And so their hearts burned. You know, it's, it's really kind of amazing that these two obscure, what is it about these two that Jesus decided to use them? Why is it that he singled out them? They seem obscure. Why them? We don't really know a reason why. But one thing that it tells us is that no one is obscure to Jesus. No one is unimportant to Jesus. You are not unimportant or obscure to Jesus. You're not someone on the outlying, uh, you know, outskirts of importance. You're right in the middle of someone who is important to him, to Jesus. He signaled them, he, he singled them out and he opened up the scripture. Now, it was of course late at night. It tells us, um, why is it, why didn't they just wait until the morning? Jesus, he, he vanished. He's not there. It's very late. Could be dangerous, you know, at this time to go back out in the streets. Why didn't they just wait for the morning? Well, we know why they didn't wait for the mornings. Because this meant that all of life has changed now. They were on the road back to Emmaus, back to their old life. Back to their old routines and just mentality all that they had known before. They were heading toward Emmaus, 
And now because of the resurrection, their life has made a 180 degree turn. And now they race back in the night. They're so excited. All of life, this means that all of life is different. And so they race back to tell the others what they had found, what they had experienced. <clears throat> and the question now for you and me is what about you? And what about me? What about us? Have you had an encounter with Jesus? Have you had your eyes opened? Have you had your heart caught on fire? Has Jesus fed you with the bread of himself, of his resurrection? Had it satisfy your heart and change not just your head, but your heart and your direction and your life as well? You see, when he... And when we when he comes to us and when the father draws us to Jesus and he opens up our eyes and when we do have an encounter with him we the Bible explains to us that we're made born again and by having a new spirit that is now brought to life that spirit even though our bodies our old dying bodies are part of this old world the Bible explains that our spirits that have been brought to life and are united to Jesus now, the new creation one, that our spirits now become a part of the new world to come. Do you want to encounter Jesus? Do you want to have an experience of, of having your eyes open and your heart to catch fire and to burn and to have your, your spirit brought to life and be a part of that new world? Do you want to be a part of the world that is coming. Believe the good news, my friend. Jesus, he's risen. It really is true. He really does exist. He's here. He's with you right now in your home. He's here with us right now. He can change and open your eyes. He can make our hearts burn. He can give you totally a new direction in life so that we turn from Emmaus to his kingdom and his mission that he can invite us to. He can make us part of the new world to come. Just ask him to stay. Invite him in. See, God won't force himself on you. You have to make a decision to surrender and give God your life. Remember what it said in the passage. It said he acted like he was going to go on. And that's what God might do this morning for you or in your life right now. He may just keep going unless you ask him, no, no, stay. We have to ask him, is it something that God does or is it something that we do being saved? Yes, it's both. But we have to exercise the choice of asking God into our lives and saying, will you please stay? Stay with me. Feed me with yourself, open my eyes, make my heart burn. See, we have to ask God, you have to ask God. Have you asked God all the way? I encourage you to do that. To have an encounter with Jesus, to turn back from our Emmaus toward Jerusalem, toward him and his kingdom, toward his truth and toward his new world that's coming, to turn toward that and say yes. Will you please stay with me? Will you come into my home and into my life and change me and open my eyes and make my heart burn? And he will. He promises that he will do that. So let's do that now by prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for this passage. Lord, we thank you that you're so kind and gentle that you wouldn't force us to love you. You don't force us to accept the gift of dying and rising and now filling us and satisfying us. You don't force yourself, Lord. And so we have to ask you, and so we do right now, each of us, Lord. We ask you to please forgive us for all the many horrible things we've done. We thank you, Jesus, of the necessity that now we do understand how central death is 
in our need, what was an instrument of despair is now the object of our glory, your cross. And so we pray, Jesus, that you would come into our lives, that you would give us an encounter with you that would truly draw us away from the Emmaus life that we think is more satisfying than you. Will you please make our heart burn? Open our eyes to see your existence, to see how really the whole story of the Old Testament is one story of your salvation, which you've now knitted us into and made us a part now of the new world to come by making our spirits born again. Lord, we love you and we pray that you would change us. Help us now, Lord, to take this joy, this hope, this love, this non-condemning um, warm acceptance to other people around us as well. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. All this in your name we pray.